Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Giovanni Gerdovic. I am a SUSE employee uh, based in uh, Prague, Czech Republic. And uh, of interest for this talk are pluggable CPU schedulers in OpenSUSE. View expressed this claim. I am required to tell you that the opinion expressed here belongs solely to me and do not reflect the views of my employer. This is because the company has not uh, uh, decided how to approach uh, this particular technology. I am personally enthusiastic about it, and so I have built a tumbleweed packages and I am experimenting with it and telling people what can be done with it, but uh, I'm here in uh, the capacity of a community member. So what are we talking about? Um, CPU scheduler, that is the part of the kernel that uh, uh, is responsible for deciding uh, where the applications, the user mode application runs, where, which means on which CPU, when, so when does it start and for how long, so how long is the time slice. So this is the task scheduler, the kernel scheduler. and. Uh, in Linux, uh, there are uh, um, essentially a few scheduler. I would say three: the deadline, the real time, and uh, the fair scheduler. The last, this last one is the uh, the most uh, uh, used by uh, the one you get by default. But with this particular kernel patch, which is uh, not merged in the upstream kernel, uh, you have the opportunity to um, write. Uh, your own task scheduler as a loadable BPF program. BPF, for those uh, who are not uh, familiar, is uh, a particular virtual machine that runs in the kernel and uh, performs some checks on the code. You, you make sure, it's like a, a kernel module, but you can't crash the machine with a BPF module. So it's more restricted, more uh, secure, and it allows a great degree of uh, customizability. So you can write your scheduler in BPF, and uh, you load your scheduler, and you don't need to reboot. Um, and you can switch them at runtime. So why would you want to do that? Why uh, is the, the kernel, uh, the scheduler that we get from the kernel uh, not good enough? Well, um, there are a few motivations for this project, which I should say is not my work. This is, uh, this is a patch that uh, in this particular instance has been written uh, by Meta, which is the company that runs Facebook and also uh, other companies are interested in contributing to it. Um, anyway, so this is not my work. I'm telling you uh, something that I have experimented with. Um, so why would you want to do that? So um, it is, uh, a, uh, what are the advantages that you can have by writing your own scheduler? Well, it is good for uh, students. They would uh, have uh, an easy way to make changes to a core component of the kernel and see their uh, effect uh, rapidly, immediately, without needing to recompile. Then it's useful for uh, researchers who want to do experiments, test new algorithms, and see what they do. And uh, also it is of great interest for performance and why. Because if you can write your own little program that uh, does scheduling, you can afford to make it specific to your workload. So if you are, I don't know, doing gaming, you can uh, observe and trace an instrument how your video game is using your machine, and then you make a task scheduler that is optimized for that. Uh, and then you would say, okay, but this scheduler is good for my game, and maybe it's not good for when I surf the internet. Yeah, sure, but for surfing the internet, you may have a different scheduler. So if you enter this uh, paradigm where the scheduler can be specific to the thing that you're actually doing, and it doesn't need to uh, be um, to serve a, a variety of uh, tasks, of um, uh, applications, then you could, could uh, possibly squeeze more efficiency out of, uh, out of your hardware. 
So this is uh, the, the, the slide that essentially I came here for. Uh, you can read about, read about uh, uh, this particular patch online. It has been um, uh, described by the trade press, blogs, etc. Um, what I uh, did for this presentation is I uh, made a tumbleweed kernel with this uh, change. And this is the, the, um, the link to the OBS project, which, so this is a repo where you would download a kernel that has uh, the, this patch in it, right? Now, I'm not an experienced packager, and I, as you can see, the, the project is called SCED-X-4 because it was my fourth attempt on that day to, to have it running. So this I expect to have a, a better uh, URL for my project, um, but this works. I mean, it has a, an ugly name, but uh, you can install this repo and you get a kernel you can experiment with uh, today. Uh, since the project is likely, as I said, going to change uh, um, URL, I have created a page on the wiki, on the OpenSUSE wiki, where I will, uh, th and I think this link is uh, maybe more important than the OBS one, which is going to change. I expect this uh, link to stay there, and I will write uh, progress and uh, the new uh, URL. The, so the bookmark the link. You see what I mean? Um, the, this, um, the, the, the OBS project uh, is working, but uh, I probably changed the name. Then other links. This is the, um, the kernel tree, which is not the, the, the repository of Linux Torvalds. It's the repository of the author of this particular change. You can see it, it here, TJ. This gentleman is called Tejon Hao. Uh, it's a meta employee. So this is his uh, tree. And this goes together with um, some user space code, uh, toolchain, etc. cetera, uh, because those BPF programs uh, are not in the kernel. You write them uh, while you run your machine and then you load them. So there is, some, uh, there is a toolbox that is on this uh, GitHub uh, repository. And, um, and now I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, uh, once you have uh, this framework that exposes hooks to BPF, you can write your scheduler in BPF, or you can do something else, which is have essentially a shim, a very light BPF uh, program that simply exposes the data to user space. And then your scheduling logic can live in user space. And there is a framework for that in, um, in this GitHub repo and you would have a user space scheduler. Uh, this framework, framework is in Rust, and um, so you can write your scheduler in Rust and use the uh, um, change, build, and, and run uh, workflow that uh, is familiar with user space coding. You don't have to you know, reboot the machine, etc. cetera. So this is, those are valuable links, and this is an important slide. Uh, I have like 10 or 15, but this is a, a slide that I would like to uh, stress. So uh, now let's, uh, I would like to introduce you to, if you're not familiar, uh, to, the, to scheduling uh, in general. So uh, what is the business of scheduling uh, tasks or threads? So threads can be running or sleeping, okay? So if they're running, they are in one of those two circles, can be running in kernel mode or user mode. You typically in use, are in user mode, then you call a syscall and you go in kernel mode, okay? But at some point, when you are in kernel mode, sometimes you wait for the disk or you try to acquire a lock which is not available. So um, you uh, need to relinquish the CPU because you have to wait for something. And this is called going to sleep. So um, you get out of the CPU and you're waiting for your disk, you're waiting for your network, etc. At some point, the resource is available and you become runnable. So you are runnable and you are in the run queue of the CPU. So um, now you are here and you're waiting to, to get a CPU. And the scheduler is the part that gets you a CPU. So you get out of the kernel from here, but you also uh, can get out of the kernel from this other arrow. So when the, when the resource is available here, you are going to sleep and getting back is called waking up. Okay? But this uh, uh, couple of arrows here, those, this is the... Um, is pre it's called preemption. So your time slice is over. Even if you run, uh, there are other programs, 
that other threads that needs to run. And the scheduler does this arbitration. And uh, so this is what scheduler is about. Scheduling is about. Now, uh, when, when, where is the scheduler? Like, is there a program called scheduler? No, it's a function of the kernel, and it's called the uh, schedule. And it is invoked at uh, a defined uh, set of uh, points uh, during the life cycle of uh, of your program, which is, I mentioned that you your user uh, space code can invoke a syscall when when the syscall is over the kernel invokes the scheduler that's that's a convenient point to invoke the scheduler there is another thing another uh, uh, canonical point to invoke the scheduler which is when uh, an interrupt handler uh, is over so interrupts is uh, keys on the keyboard, packets on the network, whatever. They happens all the time. There is also a timer interrupt, a recurrent one. And, and interrupt is a hardware concept. The CPU rises this uh, trap. And then you execute some code. Essentially, your user code is interrupted, and the kernel does something. When the kernel is done, it says, wait a minute. I could do something else, which is invoke the scheduler. So this is um, where the schedule be it the kernel one or the one that you write in BPF is invoked. Um, when uh, the scheduler is uh, invoked, it needs to choose tasks, and it goes in. Um, it goes in. A, it searches for for the scheduler classes. It searches for threads in what are called classes. So there are, there are three, and the fourth one is the one that we're discussing today, the ext or external class. Oops. What happened? OK. So the scheduler goes over the, those uh, classes and look for, t t for tasks. So it goes in the most uh, urgent one, which is called deadline. Is there anything to do in deadline? No? OK, next one. Is there anything to do in real time? No. Next one. Is there anything to do in fair? Oh, yes, I have a thread in fair. So it picks a thread in fair. And the next iteration of the scheduler is going to go again doing this search starting from the top. So is there anything to do in deadline? Is there anything to do in real time? This is important because it means that if you have stuff, if, there is, if uh, one of those classes that are higher up in this list is populated, you never get to the one on the top on the bottom. All right? Those are more urgent. Why does, I'm sorry that I lost control. And, so uh, I'm saying this because our uh, BPF uh, scheduler is not in a very good position, as you can say, it's the last one. So this was a, a way for the, for the developers to say, we're being nice, OK? So our code does not take over your machine. Our code actually never runs. Because if you have a task uh, in, uh, in the fair class, external is never invoked, right? So um, having it on uh, complete equivalence with, which, with fair, which is the default class, would have been more complex. So what they did was, OK, we're going to put it below fair. And uh, if you want to make any sort of use of our framework, you have to, to um, set this config option that says we're going to take over fair. So your uh, BPF scheduler, if you have this config option that makes it usable at all, will uh, vacuum all the fair tasks or threads and take them, take care of them. The deadline and real time, they stay there. So the deadline and real time are still serviced. There are uh, important uh, threads in real time. Some kernel threads are there. So you don't want to mess with them. But uh, the, the SCADEX is, uh, to be useful, is going gonna, gonna to take all the fair with it. What does it look like writing a scheduler in, um, with this uh, framework? Well, you have to provide several uh, callbacks, right? And those callbacks correspond to the uh, action, to the events that uh, uh, the scheduler can do. So select the CPU. So where am I putting my, my task? In queue, so put the task in that uh, runnable state we were, we were discussing. And so there are all these, uh, each of those uh, uh, callbacks correspond to um, an action of this sort of state machine that the scheduler is. But your algorithm will live in those callbacks. So that is the, 
the framework that what provides it. And then you have, those are all functions, function pointers, and uh, here you have some flags. I don't recall exactly what they are. Timeout is important. Timeout is um, uh, in milliseconds, and um, it uh, regulates the operation of a watchdog that is a safety, a, a fail-safe mechanism. If your scheduler is not very good and is not scheduling, so it is not uh, putting any task on the CPU for more than, I don't know, five seconds, then the framework will remove, will unload your scheduler and fall back to the default uh, Linux uh, scheduler. Um, yes, so this is in, in line with this, uh, with BPF uh, essentially um, as, a, as a technology uh, regulating uh, uh, and uh, limiting the damage that you can do with bad code essentially. And then there is the name that you can give to your scheduler. And um, when I, w I mentioned uh, user space scheduling, so this is also possible as I discussed. Um, the framework would only expose the data to user space and you would have a user space um, uh, executable in Rust if you use the framework that is gaining some traction in this project. And you have, uh, well, first off, since it's a user space scheduler, you have to schedule the scheduler, but this is done in the framework, but it's... Um, uh, an interesting thought. The other thing when people think of uh, user space scheduling is that uh, the, the first uh, thought that you have if you have some familiarity with uh, kernel uh, programming is that okay there is data that is going back and forth between kernel mode and user mode and uh, in order to read this da the data which is for example to know what is the content of my rank queue or to know what my tasks are doing I have to talk to the kernel, which means issue a syscall, which is a, a, an expensive operation, and you say, wait a second, so for every context switch that you do, you have to, call, to have a syscall? That defies the purpose of performance, and it seems like it would grind the machine to a halt. Well, this particular frame, the, the, the sched X, as it is called, the, this project, um, works around this uh, uh, limitation by poking into the uh, boundaries between uh, kernel and user mode. Uh, there are two ring buffers that are offered by BPF. One is uh, to uh, send data from kernel to user, which is something that you may have seen in other contexts. For example, there is uh, uh, a tool called ftrace or a tool called perf, the profiler, and you can you have all this kernel data that you, you see in, um, in those uh, ring buffers. So looking at kernel data from user space, okay. Sending data from the user to the kernel um, on user-initiated um, interaction, well, that didn't exist. And they made uh, this uh, other, the other way, the user versus kernel uh, ring buffer ex explicitly for this use case. Um, it's not a coincidence that the uh, SCADEX developer work at Meta and the BPF developers, uh, most of them, the maintainer, they also work at Meta, so they essentially uh, collaborate uh, um, tightly into this uh, development. So uh, we are now 4.18 uh, and uh, those are the big questions. So this is the other slides that, uh, that I want to attract your attention on. The first one was the links. So uh, there is this package that I made and more importantly the wiki page which contains some directions on how to uh, get started. And this is the other slide that is, um, let's consider the implication of what's going on here. <laughs> because uh, uh, writing your own task scheduler, okay, that is uh, opening a wide range of uh, challenges and opportunities. So um, the first, uh, uh, so I, I, I listed five items as I see them and I would like your, uh, your feedback if you have or your thought. So the first one is, uh, I call it quality, which is, um, People are going to write their own scheduler. Maybe as a distro you want to have some uh, way for uh, uh, the scheduler that people write to evaluate their quality, but I'm not talking of correctness. We have seen the watchdog uh, that uh, takes care of that. I mean, the scheduler doesn't schedule, you're out, fine. But I'm talking about quality of service, um, so something more uh, soft, but can I uh, quantify, and you can, but you have to write the tests, and it's, a, it's a hard, uh, hard work. Can you quantify the, 10 minutes, yes. Can you quantify the, um, uh, 
the, the, the starvation uh, or the, the fairness of your scheduler or the work conservation. It's a property that means that uh, if you have some work to do, you don't have any CPU idle because that would be uh, counterproductive. There is something to do and there is resources unused. Work conservation. So can I, can I measure that and uh, or uh, test all the we saw that those scheduler likely are going to be application specific or workload specific, but you also want to make sure that they are still uh, can service the rest of the applications. I make my server for my scheduler for the video game that I like, but I would like the web browser to still run on it, even if very slowly, but uh, uh, that it um, provides a degraded service. And so this is quality. Support. Um, there are going to be bugs opened and uh, uh, the user that opened those bugs may have uh, a third party scheduler running. So as an incident responder, the community or uh, employees such as myself, you're going to see um, some of the system uh, you know and some of the system you don't know. So okay, you're going to ask them, let's reproduce without uh, your custom scheduler. Okay, that could work, but uh, maybe not. Maybe um, removing the scheduler will uh, simply not show any, uh, uh, any issue, yet the issue was not in the scheduler. It was simply a combination of factors. So that's what I call support. Um, this is uh, something that uh, uh, I, I, I consider this uh, um, a, an aspect deserving some thought. Then there is trust. Uh, you, can, you, you will have to start shipping some BPF modules. Um, for example, the, the sample schedulers. Or we were talking about user space scheduling. You need that shim, that uh, uh, thin shim that, uh, of BPF. And that's going to be a module. Uh, you're probably going to sign that so that there is an attestation. The, um, the, 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 you can, uh, the, the user can be sure of the provenance of this code. How do you sign BPF executables? Honestly, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I don't know, um, I don't know, but uh, that's something to be um, figured out. Um, there are, it's, I'm not the first one uh, person thinking about signing maybe have, uh, executables, but I, I don't see an established uh, um, uh, uh, practice, so I'm not. Toolchain, all right, uh, they're going to be um, mostly uh, tapping into the Rust ecosystem quite, uh, quite a lot because the user space. Uh, scheduler that I mentioned, the framework is in Rust. Rust, uh, uh, um, we have uh, Rust expertise uh, in the community, uh, but packaging it, so Rust doesn't do shared objects, right? It doesn't sh shared libraries, so um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you have the, 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 comp the, the, the building of a, of a Rust uh, program necessarily pulls from all the dependencies and uh, and we, we have efforts in that respect, but this is going to be another uh, user, another uh, client of that sort of effort, LLVM. LibBPF, fast moving target, that would be how you write um, BPF programs. And finally, um, process, which is uh, uh, how do you get this kernel in the hands of people? Um, I, I was thinking a separate kernel flavor in, the, in Tumbleweed, which is what I'm trying to do. Um, but uh, I mean, until there is more traction in this respect, uh, this is an, in, in, an initiative of a few, few individuals such as myself. So I mean, um, freestanding OBS project uh, somewhere. And uh, so those are the, 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 the items. I am at 4.24. Uh, I mean, I'm told that I should be sharp on time. I have a couple more slides, but they're not really that important. So I would open the floor for questions and remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. I would uh, want to say something, Jeff, or? Uh... Yeah, I just have a question. Ah, OK, OK. So there is a mic uh, uh, circulating. So what do you see for, uh, what do you see for end users wanting to use this? I mean, for companies like Meta, you can, they have a clearly defined workload and a staff to support it. But for like OpenSUSE users or you know, SUSE users, 
the idea is that they don't have to worry about that, that, that stuff. That's our job. So what do you see as the use case for this? Um, I see the, the, the thinker, the, the, the ecosystem of people who wants to understand the operating system and uh, uh, at, a, at an intimate level and do that kind of, uh, of experiments. So education and the research at the personal level. Um, I don't expect, uh, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, who knows, but uh, um, at, at, at least the initial traction, I think, will be driven by the curiosity of something that was not previously accessible. I mean, I could see, for example, like a, a major database company that has an interest in uh, scheduling performance on their own products would probably be interested in injecting their own scheduler to handle that. Um, and that's, I think, where the signing comes in handy because then you could say, you know, this vendor is allowed to load these modules and they provide it as one of their own modules as part of their software and they can control the scheduler without having to hack the kernel to do it. Yeah, absolutely. You're tapping into the, the commercial uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the market and the industry adoption for this. At that point, I think the support issue becomes relevant because you start to have those mixed systems and uh, uh, you have to have at least uh, a process to um, quickly understand if the problem is in uh, the vendor, vendor code, which would be SUSE in that case, and uh, or the, the, the user code, which, uh, so core kernel or custom scheduler. And you need to, to know, learn how to, to, to do that weeding uh, quickly. Sure, I mean, my first thought when I saw that support line is like, man, that's gonna be a nightmare. But if, if with, the, with trusted executables, if they're provided by you know, a third party, then that's something that we could work through. I see the support being difficult even, even with, uh, with, uh, with, trusted, uh, uh, with trusted BPF modules. Um, because uh, trusted or not trusted, performance regression, schedule it we don't know, and uh, we have to spend effort in proving that uh, our kernel is doing its job, and uh, they're likely going to wait for the outcome of our uh, proof before they look into their scheduler. So even if it was a trusted the scheduler, uh, trust is going to be necessary for them to, can, maybe you can explain me better the, the relationship or we can talk about it. Sure, I mean, from my perspective, if you have it as a, a it, it's no different than a third party kernel module, for example. And now we expect vendors to sign them. And when we see one of those, it gets tagged as saying, hey, you know, you have a third party module loaded and, you know, at least, commercially if, when we're supporting it. Yeah. If, if that is flagged, then if it looks related to the issue at hand, then yeah. we say, hey, go, go ask the vendor who gave you this because it looks like it's yeah. suspicious. And I would think in a similar situation, if we ended up seeing one of these loaded and it was a performance issue, we do the same thing. Yeah, I, I, uh, they, I have had this conversation several times and people tell me, it depends uh, how important the situation is and there is never, this is the first thing you do, but it doesn't always work, and this is what uh, several people in the support department, etc., are concerned about. Yeah. But yes, yes, this is the first thing you say. This is not our, it's tainted, goodbye. Yeah. On the other hand, I see lots of possibilities for research and trying out new scheduler IDs and I guess not for production, but we will see lots of experiments and that's good. Yes, very good. It definitely lowers the barrier. Yes, yes, totally. It definitely lowers the barrier to entry for people looking to experiment. 100%, yes, this is exactly why I like it. Thanks very much for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.